Emil, hello from Sydney. Thank you for making the time to speak with us from Ukraine today as you cover the war on the ground. Now, war obviously is not unfamiliar to you. Can you tell us a little bit about this journey that led you down this path of becoming a filmmaker? So I joined the military when I was 18. Uh, I was interested in the sense of adventure, traveling the world. Um, and that was pre 9-11 when not much was going on. British troops were really just deployed to Northern Ireland as peacekeeping, crowd control. And then I joined the military in 2000 and then 9-11 happened. And then when I passed out of commando training, very quickly found myself in the mountains of Afghanistan fighting um, against Al-Qaeda and the Taliban and then the invasion of Iraq in 2003. And then we continued going back to Afghanistan on several tours. So I've done several tours of Afghanistan with all three different commando units. Once I left the military in 2012 at the rank of sergeant, I'd done 12 years. I then went into private security. I went into bodyguarding work and anti-piracy work for 18 months. And I just weren't fulfilled. I weren't getting any enjoyment out of it. And then I met a guy in a bar who was going to northern Syria and northern Iraq to go fight Islamic State. And he's a former sailor. My family was still in Syria and I thought, why does this volunteer want to go fight ISIS but not me when I've got a skill set? He hasn't got a skill set. And I, I just come up with this idea that would make a brilliant documentary, me going along with them to film their experience. So in the end, I just went on eBay, bought a camera and then I flew to northern Iraq. And then for two years, I was going back and forth to Iraq and Syria filming volunteer fighters and what motivated them to go to fight Islamic State. And that's really where my filmmaking career started and then made a second documentary on international volunteers that came to Ukraine, where I'm currently now, um, fighting against pro-Russian separatists in the Donbass region. And then I moved on to 45 Days, the film um, about the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan. So really that's how my filmmaking career started. So quite the journey it has been. What made you want to cover this particular war in Nagorno-Karabakh? Many people hadn't heard about Nagorno-Karabakh, or Artsakh as Armenians call it. There was stories on the news about Azerbaijan launching attacks onto um, Nagorno-Karabakh. And then it died down very quickly within a couple of days. The media weren't really talking about it. There was no real online presence of people, Western media that was there. Um, so I started looking in more into it and I thought, why is no one covering this war? And then very quickly I flew out to Armenia, to Yerevan got my press credentials and then crossed over into Artsakh to then start recording to make 45 days. Now it's often said that the first casualty of war is the truth. You've spoken before about the media blackout that you noticed when the war first started. Even when there was international coverage of this war, it very often told the Azeri official line. Why do you think that was and how would you assess international media coverage of this war? International media coverage of the war in Artsakh it was pretty low. Even Armenia and Azerbaijan, many people won't know these countries. So when your audience doesn't know the names of the countries involved, it makes it a harder sell to pull it onto the news and tell, to make people want to care. And I think that's the bigger issue. Obviously, COVID was all over the news. It was dominating all stories. The US election was dominating the stories. And you mentioned earlier about the world seemed to take Azerbaijan's side. And I saw that quite a lot with the BBC. Even though BBC were working on both sides, their coverage from Azerbaijan was more than it was on the Armenian side. And I think that comes down to the actual anchor, the main presenter, was a more credible one that was in Azerbaijan than the one that was in Armenia. So they had more priority for airtime. But also, Azerbaijan is more of a strategic partner to many countries through oil and through gas and, and through weapons than it is, than Armenia is. And I think that's when the media takes a bit of a side and that's why it swayed them. Everyone in the world's heard about Ukraine now. Even if they didn't hear about it two, three months ago, they know about it now because it's been dominating all the stories. And I get a lot of messages from a lot of diasporans that are saying, why the world, it's not fair that the world are talking about Ukraine but not talking about Armenia. And it's though like, I've got the answer to that. Um, I don't have that answer. I'm just saying this is what the storylines they're going down uh, on what wars they support. And that's why I think 45 Days is important for non-Armenians to see because so many people watch it who are like, I know and I say, go watch it and they go, wow, I didn't even know that happened. It's a war that was totally forgotten about. And I think 45 Days and years to come, People will watch it and go, I never even knew that happened. So it was important for me as a director, it's important to document that. So for history. Emil, the first thing that struck me when I first watched the film is how at the beginning you provided the historical context, not only as it relates to the first Gharapa war, but also going back all the way to the genocide and even the Hamidian massacres. 
Now, to most foreigners, the war in Nagorno-Karabakh was simply a, a conflict over disputed territory. How did you get to know the historical context and why was it important for you to place this war within that context in the film? We decided we need to tell their backstory so people can understand what's currently going on here in 2020. What's led to 20, this war in 2020? Um, and it's a very important story to talk about the 90s war, to talk about the, the genocide of 1915 and the other massacres. And so we, we hired a, an Armenian historian and then we said, like, Give us the history, give us the lowdown. This is what we've got. Even stuff like the parliament shooting we've got in there because these are all key issues that lead up to why 2020 happened and the Velvet Revolution and everything else. And to tell Armenian history in five and a half minutes, when we first got the graphics designer and I said to him, right, I, want to, I want to make graphics to tell Armenian history in three minutes. He's like, okay, what massacre do we add? What massacre do we take out? There's been so many over the last hundred years. Um, but I think we got to about five and a half minutes for the graphics telling the backstory. Um, and everyone who's watched it, who's non armenians appreciated it, goes, now I understand where we are. Now we can start 45 days of the documentary and go on with the story. So yeah, it, it was vital to tell that. So let's talk about the title of your film. Why did you describe this war as the fight for a nation? So a lot of people, um, <laughs> Especially on social media, you get a lot of people that like try to call you out to go, well, the war was 44 days. Why have you called it 45 days to fight for a nation? But when the war ended, the 45th days, when the Russian peacekeepers started moving in to Nagorno-Karabakh outside to take over. And that's crucial in the documentary because the documentary isn't solely about the war. It's about what happened post-war. Because that story is just as important as the 44 days. The reason I went for um, the fight for a nation is because I, I felt the pain of the Armenian people, people talking at their existence and their lands that has been shrinking over the years because of the Ottomans and then the Turks and everything else. Territory has been lost and very much is a small Christian nation landlocked um, in the Caucasus that people there are actually fighting for their nation because they feel that if Azerbaijan had taken all of Nagorno Karabakh and then started pushing into the boundaries and the sovereign territory like they're currently doing at the moment of Armenia, that will there be a nation in five, ten years' time? And that's why it's fight for, we went for fight for a nation, because from the feeling of the soldiers and all the people from the diaspora and the Armenians actually in Armenia, it felt like it was um, a fight for their nation. You've definitely tapped into the right sentiment there. Now, we've mentioned before that you've both fought in wars and you've made documentaries about wars. What was different about this war? For all the wars that I've covered, um, Iraq, Afghanistan, um, Syria, Ukraine, and then Artsakh, is it, the difference was it's a smaller territory area, so there was more f concentration of fighting. It wasn't as spread out as currently what's going on here in Ukraine, where there's large battlefronts. It was smaller front lines. But also the drone warfare was something that was totally new to me. Of course, when I was in the military, we used drones to engage Al-Qaeda or ISIS or the Taliban, for example. But this was low level by actor um, and Israeli kamikaze drones, which I had never seen on a scale before that whenever you, you're out on the front line areas, not even on the front lines, anywhere in Antarctica, there, there was drones flying around and talking to the soldiers as People were seeing a documentary. You, I talked to one of the soldiers in Shushi and you talk about drones and he's like, they're like stars. There's just so many of them. And whenever you were speaking to soldiers, you could see that fear. The fact is that they felt like they're always being watched, that the drones were coming across, which was a new tactic, which Western militaries are now starting doing. And they're doing it very well here in Ukraine, the Russians and the Ukrainians, is by putting a drone over an area, an observation drone, it watches the area. And then what they do is they call artillery or rockets in to then land and what they do is they correct where it needs to go by using the drone as observation. And that was a new tactic that the Zeris were using, which I'd never seen before, and they're using it very effectively. That very much the drones in this war was the game changer, from, in my opinion, strategically on the battlefield. Let's talk a little bit about your experience on the ground. As a foreign independent journalist, how did you go about trying to cover this war? What challenges did you encounter and how did you get support? Money is always the first issue as an independent and any independent filmmaker, journalist, um, photographer you speak to, it's the same problem. The second one I had in Armenia was access. Is the Armenians were 
they're very coy about allowing people to go to the frontline areas because it was too dangerous. And I was trying to tell them, and without being arrogant about it, that I've got previous military experience, highly trained military experience. I've also covered all the wars up to this moment in that time. I'm more trained and more knowledgeable about frontline areas than actual soldiers you've got fighting in the war who only a few weeks ago were civilians working in banks and shops. So I've managed to talk them around to get access to certain areas. So that was a big limitation. Also, what came with that was the restrictions on what you could film. That because the war was ongoing and I was trying to explain to them, I'm making a documentary, this is going to be shown post-war. But they were very coy about, you can't film that vehicle, you can't film this location, you can't film that. So I was saying to them, okay, I could film this, but without showing where it is. It quite easily, we just zoom in on it, we get close up on it. And they were like, no. So that hindered me massively to making 45 Days um, in what access um, I could get to film. Did you ever consider travelling to Azerbaijan to cover the war from that perspective or from that side? It's, it's not easy to go to both sides, especially being independent. Is one, it raises suspicions, why are you on, on, why were you on that side and now you're on this side? Secondly, um, the suspicion people start thinking you're working for an intelligence service. And thirdly, it's, it's just not the dumb thing really, that for your own personal security. Like for example, here in Ukraine, if I was to try to go with the Russian forces, I know full well I'd be pulled in, interrogated, my phone would be seized, my laptop would be seized because it's got evidence, it's got, it's got intelligence that they could use. So when it came to Armenia and Azerbaijan, I didn't want to go to the Azerbaijan side. I don't think you need to go to both sides to tell a story. 45 days is a human perspective story. There's no politics in there and it shows it from the Armenian side. It's just about the people, the soldiers who fought the war, the diaspora who supported it, and the people in Armenia that were living it and fighting it. Um, and I think that's what makes 45 Days more powerful than other documentaries is because it is just humans, real stories, rather than political figures who are gonna just tell you lies or tell you what they want their political line is. Now, there were reports of um, foreign and Armenian journalists injured during this war, including two French journalists who worked for Le Monde who were injured during the Azeri um, shelling up Marduni. Were you at any stage scared for your life? As a freelancer, you, you take risks when you go to war zones. And because of my previous experience as a commando, I wouldn't say I was scared as such. There's times where you get apprehensive and you get a little bit going through that security concern mode and going, what's going on here? What's there? There was times, obviously, when the shelling was coming in because the Zeris were indiscriminately shelling at civilian areas. They had no, no regards of what they were hitting. Um, the place I was staying in Stepanica was a hotel where journalists were staying. And one night, there was, it was heavy bombing throughout, but one night it was very heavy and it was very close to our hotel. And it was literally about 100 metres up the road in the middle of a residential area, um, rounds were landed. So it gives you that reality check that this is real as such. I do my own risk assessments. I take it step by step. But I know where the line is because I'm experienced enough to say, OK, I don't need to go any further now. I've got what I need. Is it... Is to try to get a bit of footage or that photo worth risking my life as much as what I've already captured. So um, it's just playing it by ear on the ground and assessing the situation minute by minute, day by day. This indiscriminate shelling, how does it compare in your experience with previous wars? All wars I've been to, even wars I've been involved in, is that civilians are, are the, the main casualty of all wars. They're caught in between fighting forces. Um, bombs drop short or get adjusted and civilian targets um, or locations get um, hit. But yeah, same as what I've been seeing here in Ukraine now and what the Azeris were doing, it was just the psychological war. It was to fire bombs and artillery and rockets onto civilian areas to break the psychology of these people, to break them down me mentally so that the will to fight goes, that people go, okay, it's better to just surrender as such or leave this area. That's what the Azeris were trying to do. They were trying to break the will of the Armenian people and the people of the Gorno Karabakh by shelling just indiscriminately, targeting anything. Um, especially with the drones, is drones generally are smart weapons. They're not dumb bombs like artillery or just certain rockets that just that what we call dumb bombs are just thrown in a direction, land roughly in the direction there. So they're using both methods. And I think totally it was to do with the psychological war um, as well as what the Russians are currently doing here in Ukraine. Do you think it worked in terms of breaking the will of the people to fight? No, I, I wouldn't say it worked to break the will of the people to fight. Um, the Armenian soldiers, what I saw in Armenia, in nagorno karabakh and what I'm seeing here in Ukraine is they feel that they, they know they've been attacked. 
So they're the defenders of what they're doing. So they're very much their will wouldn't be broke as quickly is because they would stand in and fighting, like you're saying, um, fight for a nation. They, they believe in what they're doing. So their willpower to fight is more than their enemies as such. And that was a report that was getting, um, you're seeing a lot throughout the Gorna combat that the Zeris, that the prisoners that were caught didn't seem to want to fight as well as the Armenians because it's a long way from home. They're not fighting on their doorstep, they're fighting in someone else's land, even though they claim it's their land um, historically. They're not fighting for something that they believe in, really. So yeah, the Armenian soldiers, and you see it in the documentary, that even the ones who have been captured and been released, they've still got that resilient spirit to continue. The odds were stacked against Armenia from the start with Turkey and Azerbaijan, with what they had, weaponry, um, the skill set and such. Um, is how more advanced they are than the Armenians. And I think it was the will to fight, the fire in the belly of the soldiers and the people supporting these soldiers that it went on for 44 days. So talking about the odds being stacked against Armenia, as the war continued to range in nagorno karabakh there were stories about hired Syrian mercenaries fighting against Armenian troops on the ground. What did you see and learn in this regard? There's a lot of evidence that Syrian mercenaries were brought to nagorno karabakh and used by um, Azerbaijan and Turkey. This is a tactic Turkey used quite often. They, they paid mercenaries in northern Syria. They then paid a lot of them to go to fight in Libya. And very quickly when this war happened, that they, they sent hundreds, if not thousands, to nagorno karabakh paid to fight. I never physically saw them. However, there was dead bodies of them. There was testimonies from so many different soldiers that were all saying the same thing, that it could not have been a made-up lie from men in totally different areas explaining about the Syrian mercenaries. There was even passports found, money found on there, on, on bodies, so they're clearly not Azeris. And I think this is because the, the, the Turks use them as cannon fodder. They see them as cheap labour to push forward into an area that the Azeris might not want to actually fight this war, but these Syrians are getting paid, so they're more likely to go out and fight and do stupid, reckless things. And there was the Syrian mercenary bodies up by Shushi, like I was saying, so they were using them quite far forward on the front line. And this is what you see in 45 Days of Documentary, is that there were many men from the diaspora that travelled to Armenia to go stand and fight. And because they didn't have Armenian passports, they weren't allowed to fight. There was one guy, Gevo, you see in the documentary, who managed to get to the front lines to fight, but that was through like hiding back of vehicles, just getting, finding someone who could help him out get there. It wasn't through official channels. So Armenia was very careful to be accused of using mercenaries, unlike the Turks and the Zeris, by not even allowing diasporans to fight. In this war, Armenia was not only fighting Azerbaijan, but also Turkey. They played a critical role in supplying drones, in facilitating the movement of mercenaries, even in disseminating anti-Armenian propaganda. Um, what further insights can you share from your experience on the ground? I think really that's their main involvement um, is and how Turkey didn't, they very quickly said we support Azerbaijan in the war. And that's what, that was the key issue for, for NATO to not get involved or want to get involved because they couldn't be seen to go against another NATO partner. The Armenian military had been neglected for many years, not not just in this government, in previous governments. The tactics of the soldiers is very behind, is very Soviet-era thinking. They, they haven't modified the, the military for years, and that's a, that was the massive failure. That's why it's David versus Goliath. A, a young boy with an AK-47 sometimes, not even a 74, against this modern drone in the sky is crazy to see. Um, so very much the odds were stacked against Armenia. Um, it's because they had been neglected, um, and this is, this is the key issue. Not only that is there's a lot of corruption still in Armenia. Um, anyone who knows what goes on in Armenia knows there is corruption at certain levels. And within the military, you see that corruption, where you see poor leadership from the high commanders. That I remember I was driving to uh, Martuni, and then we're driving during the war, this is, and we stopped our car, and there were just soldiers, hundreds of soldiers in, in the wood, in the tree lines, in the forest. One of them come out, confronted us, like, what are you doing? Who are you? We showed them our press ID. They're like, OK. I was like, what are you guys up to? They're like, we're just waiting for our orders. Our commander said, wait here. That was two days ago and he left. A lot of these young men who were fighting like lions just didn't have the commanders 
to then lead them into battle. And I think that's one of the failures of this war as well. It was lions led by donkeys, as, as we say in the UK. Um, very much that men were prepared to fight, wanted to fight, but they just didn't have that leadership. And that was a massive failure for a lot of these um, young boys. Another issue was communications, that a lot of these young boys were using cell phones to communicate because they didn't have secure radios or they were using walkie-talkies. So one, the electronic warfare from Turkey was so effective, it was picking up their location and they were calling in drones to then target commanders. Two, um, with walkie-talkies, they're, they're totally insecure and anyone with the same kind of walkie-talkie, they can go onto the same frequency and listen into the, what's going on. So they didn't have any secure communications. And they were even using ICOM radios that the Taliban use. And we used to listen into the Taliban to then launch our attacks on the Taliban through an ICOM radio. And the, the Armenians were using that. So there were so many different failures um, at so many different levels in this war. Now, more than 5,000 Armenian servicemen lost their lives in this war, and thousands were left handicapped. There are many who are currently still in captivity as prisoners of war in Azerbaijan. You've done a great job in the movie, capturing this human cost of war. Of everything that you encountered on the ground, what is the one experience that will remain with you forever? I'll, I'll break it down into two. One during the war is, is the soldier's will to fight. But when you spend time with soldiers, you see the reality of humour in the face of adversity. Even though they're in a bad place, they still can smile, they can still tell a joke. The humility of humans and the resilience of the Armenian people to adapt, pe people in Nagorno-Karabakh and people in Armenia to adapt and just get on with their life, that was something that I took away. And just the hospitality of people, um, secondly, when they've got nothing, they will try to give you everything. And you see in the documentary, we go to a wife who lost her husband and she's talking and she's in tears and everything. And even though we've gone there to talk to her, um, Maria, who's in the documentary who, from the diaspora, who was giving her money to help her sustain, um, look after the children a little bit, diaspora donations, the, the wife is still running around fussing over coffees, fruits, cakes. And I got quite emotional in that moment because she's got, she just lost her husband, but she's still trying to give you everything. And I think that's the, the key to what I do and the work I try and tell is that it's the human, real story. This is reality. It's a, we know soldiers die, that's part and parcel of war, but the people are affected by it. It's like an onion, you, there's layers to a war and there's so many different layers. And from my 11 months in Armenia at that time, I saw so many different layers to so many different people um, from the diaspora, from the Armenians and from the people from Artsakh. Now in the film, you speak with a man fleeing his home in Artsakh and he makes a very poignant comparison to how Armenians were forced to flee their ancestral homeland 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago during the genocide. You also show how so many Armenians burned their homes before fleeing. How was it to be underground and to experience this tragedy in person? So after November the 10th, when the, the trilateral peace agreement w was um, signed between the Russians, the Azeris and the Armenians, is very quickly people got told, I mean, you've got to leave these territories. These territories have now been handed over to Azerbaijan. So when we were in Artsakh then capturing this and speaking to people, people who literally had two weeks to go, you've lived here all your life, but now you've got to go. And people were like, where am I going? And they're like, well, anywhere other than here. And for me as a, a director and a filmmaker watching that, it was, it was tough to see people physically putting what they could carry into their car and this weighing up do I take this item or that item? I've got my dogs, I've got my children. For me, that was the most emotional part of everything we filmed in the documentary, is just seeing people who, the byproduct of a peace agreement, who weren't involved in the war, they didn't start the war, um, they didn't end the war, but they're the ones who are suffering because of the war. So yeah, it was really tough. And like in the documentary, when the guy is burning down his um, family home, and I'm just like, there's nothing to say. And I'm thinking, do you know what I mean? I'm making a documentary, we need to talk to like make it like sound in more interesting than what it is. And I'm just like, visually, I don't need to say anything. This, you're saying it all with your actions, your, your facial expressions, your body language and physically what's going on, that's enough. But the beautiful part of that is, and I smile about this, is this guy is just, and so many other people have just packed the house up and they've just burnt their home down before they leave. And there's a massive traffic jam, no one can get out, it's stuck for hours. And then before you know it, on the other side of the road with a guy with some moonshine, cutting up bottles, um, giving us moonshine, eating stale lavish bread, doing toast. And it's just that, once again, it's that resilience of people to go, 
Life is really bad right now in this moment in time, but we're going to make a good moment of it. Stood around this fire, um, we're going to do a toast and we're going to talk about the happy times. And I think that's the balance of 45 days of documentary. It's not all sad, doom and gloom. And a lot of diaspora and people who are friends of mine now, I'm like, have you watched it yet? I can't watch it. I, I, I can't watch it. And, it. and to me as a filmmaker, that really annoys me because they say they're too, it's too emotional to watch. The documentary isn't about the sadness of things. It's about the strength of the Armenian people that have been knocked down so many times and always get back up. And the fact is, if you don't continue smiling, if you're not toasting on the side of the road, moonshine with your house burning behind you, you're not saying, uh, you're not sticking your middle finger up towards Turkey. Otherwise, you're accepting what their, their fate they're giving you. By doing that, smiling, dancing, singing and such, um, people are putting their middle finger up to Turkey and Azerbaijan and go, you're not going to destroy us. You may have taken our territory here, but you're not going to destroy us as a nation and as, as people. And I think that was the crucial part of 45 Days, what the story we're trying to say is that, yeah, I mean, you lost the war. They lost territory, but it's not over. And there's still that fight for a nation that needs to continue for the people that are living there. And also with the diaspora supporting them. Well, I think if our history demonstrates one thing, it is that as a nation, we cannot be destroyed. Emil, thank you very much for your efforts to document everything you saw and witnessed during the 44-day war in Nagorno-Karabakh. And once again, thank you for your time today. It has been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. No, you too. And thank you. Hello to Australia. <laughs>